Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Agricultural Extension Agent here in Prince William County. Welcome to this week's class, 12 Steps to a Greener Lawn. Presenting this morning is Natalie Walker, our environmental educator. Again, please make sure if you have questions, put them in the chat box. Please make sure that your mic is muted as well. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to 12 Steps for a Greener Lawn presentation. My name is Natalie Walker, and I am the environmental educator with Virginia Cooperative Extension in Prince William County, Virginia. Virginia Cooperative Extension is part of Virginia Tech and Virginia State University, and our mission is to provide unbiased research-based information to the public. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat box, and we can answer questions at the end of the presentation as well. If you would like to view this presentation again, it will be up on our YouTube page by Friday, I believe. Today we will be talking about 12 best management practices for turf. And this includes turf care calendar, soil testing, amending the soil, adjusting the pH, proper mowing, watering, weed control, disease control, insect control, aeration, fertilization, repair, seeding, measuring, and calibrating. First, I'd like to start off with a summary at Longwood Gardens on what they consider the perfect lawn. You may notice dandelions and other weeds in the turf grass at Longwood. In an effort to be better stewards of the land and to reduce the use of, use of herbicides, Longwood has chosen to tolerate rather than chemically eliminate all the weeds. Cultural methods are used to reduce the use of herbicides on lawns, such as planting improved turf grass varieties, raising mowing heights to shade weed com competitors and fertilizing in fall to maintain balanced nutrient levels. Lawn care, or perfect lawn, is really in the eye of the beholder, and they've chosen to tolerate weeds instead of treating them chemically. They want to work with nature instead of against it, and that is the foundation of the 12 Steps presentation today. Some of the benefits of good turf lawns includes that it looks good, it has a cooling effect of an average size lawn, is equal to about nine tons of air conditioning. Turf grass traps an estimated 12 million tons of dust and dirt released annually into the atmosphere. Healthy lawns can absorb rainfall six times more effectively than a wheat field and four times better than a hay field. 90% of the weight of grass plant is in its roots, which is important in stabilizing soil and preventing erosion. And a 50 by 50 foot area of healthy turf absorbs carbon dioxide, ozone, sulfur dioxide, and other gases, and releases enough oxygen for a family of four. So what you do in your yard really affects the pond. And with proper turf maintenance, you and your neighbors can reduce nutrients and sediments going into the lake pond, and it keeps the lake clean and looking like a lake. The soils in Prince William County are great, <laughs> however, not for lawns. Prince William soils, they're good soils, clay loams, fungal dominant, acidic, with a pH of 4 to 5.5. The soil is actually programmed for hardwood forests and not lawns and gardens. And suburban lots suffer from compaction, which means not enough air, water, and not enough room for roots to grow. Another thing to note is trees, shade, and lawns don't necessarily go together. Trees tend to be tough on competitors such as turf grass, and you need at least six hours of direct sun for any hope of growing a lawn. Four to six hours gives a minimal chance for success. And you might really wanna consider alternatives such as ground covers and moss. And Nancy Berlin, the natural resources specialist with the extension office in Prince William did a wonderful presentation last week on ground covers, which is also on our YouTube page. And there's various books and a Virginia Tech publication on moss if um, anyone's interested in learning more about those. With alternative ground covers, there's many choices. And you wanna choose species that don't die back to the ground in the winter. Minuses, most aren't available as seed. It can be costly to convert a large area. Poor tolerance of play foot traffic. So if you have kids or animals that are in the, the yard, lawn chemicals aren't always safe for ground covers and your HOA might not allow it. And some of the benefits for ground cover is once they're established, they require little maintenance. Most are fertilized at planting or if they show signs of nutrient deficiency. 
there's a lot of species options that you can choose from that um, do well in shade and sun. They can add color and texture to the landscape. Probably my favorite is that many of the ground covers are nectar sources for pollinators. So some of these ground covers include moss. There's about 12,000 species. Ground ivy can be considered a weed and turf, but it does make a really great ground cover. And bugleweed can be a little invasive in shady situations, just to point that out. Bugleweed, yarrow, hellebores, liriope, thyme, euphorbia, Pennsylvania sedge, meadow flowers, cranesbill, hardy geranium, bluewood aster. There's an arrow pointing up to the, it's like purplish blue, and the golden groundsel to the right with the yellow flowers. They're actually natives and they, are showing promise in outcompeting the invasive Japanese stilt grass that we do have here in Northern Virginia. It's a, a really great benefit of those two. If you have perennials that die back to the ground, use in a mulch bed to help protect the soil when they die back. And that can be hostas, squirrel corn slash bleeding heart. And sometimes there might not be the right place for a plant based on the usage of your lawn. So if you have heavy shade plus heavy use, it might be hard to find a ground cover for that. Another option is permeable hardscapes, which are preferred over impermeable ones. Permeable hardscapes are hardscapes that can absorb rainwater. Impermeable ones would be the rooftop or the concrete driveway where the water just um, totally runs off. So you want to choose something that is permeable, preferably. Turf care is all about timing. You want to work with nature and not against nature. You want to look at turf care calendars based on the type of grass you have. So there's actually cool season grasses and warm season grasses, and we'll get to those a little bit later. You want to use the pest management guide to determine correct application of herbicides and pesticides. We have an email address and a phone number to call the Extension Horticulture Help Desk here in Prince William County. And like I said before, maintenance schedule differs from cool season and warm season grasses. So you just want to make sure you know what you have to do the proper management of that grass. Okay, so this is just a picture and an example of warm season turf grass. So if your lawn looks like this in the winter, you have warm season turf grass. I have seen a few, few of these in my neighborhood, but they do green up eventually. Cool season grasses, fescues, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, optimum top growth, um, the temperature is between 60 and 75. Optimum root growth is between 40 and 60 degrees. There's little or no winter dormancy, continuously active root system, there's different shade tolerant cool season grasses. So fine fescues, the best for shade tolerance. Tall fescues average, perennial rye is average and Kentucky bluegrass is poor. Tall fescue is a bunch grass, so it grows in clumps. It's a slower spreading by seed and tillers, more shade tolerant than bluegrass, longer roots, so it's more drought tolerant than bluegrass and it germinates in one to two weeks. Kentucky bluegrass, another cool season grass, spreads by rhizomes, which are underground stems, needs full sun, shallow root system, so it's less drought tolerant, and germinates in three to four weeks. So here are some examples of cool season turf texture. Kentucky bluegrass is on the left. It has a, a boat tip. Fine fescue has a needle tip. Tall fescue has an angle tip. There's something called K31, and it's a type of tall fescue. Its seed is inexpensive, but if you take K31 and plant it into a tall fescue with more um, advanced genetics, it may look like a weed, just as a heads up. And the last one is perennial ryegrass that has an angle tip. There are different growth patterns for cool season turf grass and warm season. So this photo right here shows cool season grass growth patterns. There's actually two growth windows. One is in the early spring and then in the fall. And fall is actually the preferred time when we want to do most of our maintenance. It helps prepare grass for the following spring, but also the summer too. And this is the turf care calendar that I was referring to earlier. 
So it just gives you a breakdown of the months and when to soil test, for example, when to core aerate, weed control, insect control, disease control. And you can see a lot of it is in the fall. Next is our warm season grasses, which include Bermuda grass, which is also known as wire grass, nimble will, which is actually native, and zoysia grass. Bermuda grass and nimble will are considered weeds in cool season grasses. So just a few things about warm season grasses. The optimum top growth is at temperatures from 80 to 95. Root growth at similar temperatures. Very efficient water and light users low maintenance, and almost no insect disease. There is winter dormancy, but the green up begins with temperatures at about 55 degrees. There are some shade tolerant warm season grasses, so Bermuda is worse for shade. Zoysia is average for shade. Centipede is average, and St. Augustine is best for shade, as well as nimble will. And here is the seasonal growth pattern of warm season turf grass. There's one big growth window. It's actually in the summer to early fall, and it's the opposite of cool season grass, grass growth pattern. So that's why it's so important to know if you do have cool season or warm season grasses. And here is a calendar for warm season turf care calendar, and it has January through December, and it's in the same format as the cool season grass, but if you look at it a little bit closer, you can see that the dates and the months are a little bit different than cool season. Of the warm season grass in its winter dormancy period, but dormancy does not equal uh, dead, so it'll eventually come out of uh, dormancy. And zoysia grass has the longest winter dormancy out of the warm season grasses. So some turf companions you might want to consider, or you might luckily already have in your, your lawn, is white clover. It's traditionally part of lawns. There are pluses and minuses, of course, so white clover is shade tolerant. It adds nitrogen to the soil, enriches diversity. It's hard to get an even distribution. It's more or less the same height as cool season grasses, and it should be overseeded into an established grass. Then there's micro clover. It's a type of white clover. It's not as shade tolerant as traditional white clover. It's not as competitive as traditional white clover. It blends in better with turf. However, it can be very pricey. It can be found in some eco-turf mixes, and there are best management practices that are still being developed for micro clover. The area on the left is a mix of fescue and micro clover, and the area on the right is just all fescue. You can't really tell the difference unless you're standing on it and looking down, but with the fescue and micro, micro clover, you can still have a nice lawn carpet look, but there's also the diversity of having the micro clover in it. Number two of our 12 steps is soil testing, and you can soil test when the ground is not frozen. Soil testing is really important. You want to soil test and this should be done every three years. Two years if you have sandy soil. Soil should be moist but not soggy. You want to avoid high or low spots or any unusual spots. Test problem areas separately and skip your pet's favorite spots where they use the restroom. And you want to measure lawn area to compute fertilizer needs. With collecting soil samples, the photo on the left, they're using a soil probe, and you want to use foot press and um, do not press at an angle. And then on the right, you can see the sample of soil inside the probe, and you want to get down to three to four inches. You want to take multiple samples, about 12 to 20 samples for a 5,000 square foot lawn, and mix the subsamples well together. Place in a bucket and remove grass clippings or roots. You want to mix soil subsamples to uniform sample, and one to two cups is sufficient for most tests. The photo on the right is the soil form that is filled out and sent to the Virginia Tech Soil Lab, 
And then the white box they provide, that is where the um, mixed subsamples go and are sent off to the lab. So there's some soil testing options. Like I mentioned, there's a Virginia Tech soil lab. Kits are available from the Extension Office, Chin and Bull Run Libraries, $10 per sample. There's commercial labs, $10 or more per sample. And at the Prince William County Virginia Cooperative Extension Office, there's the Best Lawns Program, which includes sampling of your lawn, measuring your lawn, and then an individual nutrient management plan is written up for you. And one, one sample is $40, and $15 for each additional soil sample. This is just an example of a um, soil test, the results from Virginia Tech. So they give you an analysis, they show you um, your soil pH, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and other macronutrients or micronutrients. Um, they give you a lime recommendation and um, fertilizer recommendations for your specific site. So it's tailored to your lawn. You want to add lime according to soil test results and when the ground is not frozen or snow covered. Soil components. Soil is a mixture of mineral, organic matter, air, and water which may support plant life. And you can see from the two high graphs on the bottom, 45% is mineral, 5% is organic matter, so that's 50%. And then on the right, there's 25% air and 25% water. Correcting soil pH is actually the key to unlocking soil nutrients. It's the number one way to improve soil. And that's why it's so important to get your soil tested so you can find out what your pH is and adjust accordingly. It's a reading that measures the hydrogen ion activity in the soil, acidity and alkalinity. There's 14 divisions, seven is neutral, and then to the left is more acidic, and to the right of seven is more basic. So the preferred pH range for grasses is 6.2 to 6.8, and it's the blue, two blue columns in the middle. Native soils natural pH range is in the um, pinkish column on the left. And our native soils are great for hydrangeas, but not so good for turf when you have an incorrect pH, you apply the fertilizer, but then the weeds actually take it up instead of the grass, and then there can be excess runoff of the fertilizer. But when you have a correct pH, you apply the fertilizer, it goes to the grass. Some of the weeds do absorb it still, but there um, shouldn't be as much ac excess as if you had an incorrect pH. So again, this is why it's so important to have a correct pH. Raising soil pH should be based on soil test results. You can use agricultural lime or ground limestone or calcium carbonate. They're all the same and they come in either pelletized or as a powder. There's dolomitic lime. It's cheap and gives reliable results. You can, with dolomitic lime, you can substitute for ag lime, but dolomitic lime has more magnesium in it. And if the magnesium is out of balance, the lab right, might recommend dolomitic lime. Wood ashes, potash gives variable results. Gypsum supplies calcium without raising soil pH, but it does not enhance the structure of heavy clay soils. Gypsum does have some agricultural use, but in a home lawn situation, it's not very useful. And too much lime can be harmful. So you want to make sure you get that soil test to let you know if you do need lime or if you don't need lime and to make sure that you know the square footage of your lawn. Organic matter is crucial to a good soil. It has microbial activity. It helps soils resist compaction. It improves soil structure and helps soil retain moisture and nutrients. With organic matter, you can top dress annually or more often with one fourth inch of compost. Fill in two inches of compost when establish, establishing a new lawn. And healthy microbes equals a healthy lawn. So that's the number two way to improve your soil. Mowing height is extremely important. With the right height, that means deeper, stronger roots. 
which leads to healthier grass. And with the right height, there's fewer weeds. The height of the grass, it's outcompeting the weeds. So you wanna make sure that you cut at the right height. As you can see on the bottom picture, there's close mowing. And you can see that the roots aren't as large and strong as the grass on the right with the proper mowing height. Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, creeping red fescue, two to three and a half inches. Tall fescues, three to four inches. And for Bermuda and Zoysia grass, it's one inch. The pictures on the bottom right, you can see the grass is four inches. And then the photo below that, the grass is cut to two inches and the sunlight is coming through. Since the weeds are receiving the sunlight and the grass is cut shorter, they're able to compete with the turf grass. You wanna follow the one third rule, which is removing no more than one third of the blade each mowing. So this prevents excessive stress and prevents having to steal energy reserves from the roots. With mowing direction, you should alternate every one to two mowings to prevent grass laying over and promote an even cut. This is especially important at high mowing heights. Mow at a right angle, 90 degrees to, pre to previous mowing. A fun fact is if you leave the grass clippings, it actually is free fertilizer, which is great. So one season's clippings can provide the nutrients equal to 0.5 to one pound of nitrogen. Full season lawn clippings do not cause thatch when mowed properly. Dead stems and dead crowns cause thatch. A half an inch or less of thatch is good for lawn. It insulates and protects from traffic and extreme temperatures. Grass clippings are 90% water and break down quickly to return nutrients to the lawn. And double cut your lawn during extended wet periods. So this means mow on highest setting when wet, and then when the clippings dry, mow again at desired height at right angle to wet cut. You wanna make sure you service your mower depending on hours of use. So change oil, replace air filter, replace spark plug, and sharpen blades after 10 hours of use. So the picture on the right shows grass blades that were cut up and torn apart by a not sharp mower blade. Some watering basics, you either water or you don't. Spring rain should provide adequate irrigation of lawn. And once you start summer watering, you should continue. Inconsistent watering can weaken plants. These are the watering basics if you water. One inch per week in summer, full season grass. One inch once a week, ideally, or half an inch, inch twice weekly. One inch per thousand square feet is approximately 625 gallons, and you wanna watch for excess runoff. You want to water deep and infrequently, which promotes deep grass roots and curbs weed development and water early in the morning. Some reasons why you might not want to water, warm season turf, established turf almost never needs it. Cool season turf goes dormant in the summer but may have some damage but usually recovers in the fall and water can be expensive. You want to follow the integrated pest management, which is to identify the weed first instead of just treating it without knowing what it is. Determine if it's a problem. Clover is often thought of as a weed, but it actually provides nitrogen to the soil and feeds pollinators. You wanna use the control of least harm and timing is everything for weed control. You wanna identify weeds before you select a control. You can email the extension help desk to send in pictures if you are having issues identifying weeds and we can help you with control of the weed. Cultural weed controls, you wanna mow high, healthy lawn and pull it out. Pre-emergent herbicides stop plants from germinating. They work mostly on weed grasses, maybe 80% effective under ideal conditions, uh, may need to be reapplied, and, but they can interfere with grass seedlings too, so you wanna eye on that. Post-emergent herbicides work on weeds that have already sprouted. Effectiveness varies by weed, chemical formula, and timing of the application. Synthetic herbicide usage. You wanna give herbicides a chance to work before reapplication. The label will specify minimum wait period. You want to allow herbicides to translocate throughout the plant. And you want to make sure that you always, always read and follow all pesticide labels. This is very important. Organic herbicide usage, uh, again, give a chance for the herbicides to work before reapplication. Almost all are non-selective, so they might harm other 
plants nearby. And again, always read and follow all pesticide labels, even if it's an organic herbicide, because it doesn't, just because it's organic doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. Again, we want to identify the pests, control early, use the control of least harm. Insect problems are not much of a problem in Northern Virginia and disease pressure is high, but our control options are limited. So here's a picture of brown patch. It's the most common turf disease in our area. It's worse than a highly fertilized turf. It likes hot, humid weather, which is what we have right now. Brown patch usually will not kill the turf. It, the leaves are damaged, but um, not the crowns. Disease control options, fertilize correctly to reduce the problem. You, wanna, you can live with it and hope the grass recovers. If you apply synthetic fungicide, it can often do more harm than good. And organic fungicides have not proven effective in controlling diseases. Some insect damage, again, you wanna identify the damage um, caused by the insect and certain diseases can mimic insect damage. You wanna verify that the populations are significant, significant enough to warrant using chemical control, about 10 um, insects per square foot. So the top right pictures, there's only about four grubs and then the bottom pictures, there's lots and lots of grubs. Grubs are the number one lawn insect. You wanna scout, which is basically means just looking out for them in June and August. And you wanna treat in August. Webworms are number two. You want to scout in summer and they're best seen in the morning. To prevent webworms, you want to keep turf mowed higher than two and a half inches and keep thatch less than a half an inch. Guidelines for cultural insect control maintain healthy turf. If you irrigate water deeply and infrequently, mow high and don't over fertilize. Dethatch when thatch levels are greater than a half an inch. It's not a problem in most of our lawns. The warm season grasses, well, no, Bermuda grass and zoysia and bluegrass are most susceptible. So um, bluegrass is cool season. Warm season grass you want to treat in late spring, early summer, and cool season grass spring or early fall. Chemical control using synthetic pesticides. It's important to target species when they are vulnerable to insecticides. Again, you want to consider pest population size. Is it even worth using an insecticide? Think about what cultural controls might work instead of just applying an insecticide. And you don't want to aerate warm season turf until it has greened up in late spring. So again, you can see there's a difference of timing for aeration for cool season turf and warm season turf. So this is a fescue lawn in late March with a warm season weed grass nimble will. You'll see that the nimble will has not greened up yet. So generally nimble will will green up first, then Bermuda grass, and then zoysia grass. So if your warm season turf is still tan, it's too early to aerate or fertilize. Core aerating, only aerate if necessary. You can core aerate prior to fertilizing and or overseeding. Core aerate, bike aeration is not effective and apply compost after aerating. Core aeration reduces surface compaction, reduces water runoff and puddling, enhances heat and drought stress tolerance, and reduces the need to dethatch. And this picture shows the different steps with before aeration, after core removal, and six to eight weeks later after aeration. When to fertilize? Warm season grass, you want to fertilize late spring through midsummer. Cool season grass, autumn is preferred, which is September, October, November, the sun time frame. Or spring, if desired, but it actually may do more harm than good to fertilize cool season grass in the spring. You want to consider what you want versus what you can or will achieve. Some of the concerns about spring, early spring fertilization is that it promotes shoot growth at the expense of root growth. So you can expect more frequent mowing. There's a higher risk of brown patch disease and annual weed germination in spring will also benefit from fertilization. So this is why doing this in the fall is the better time frame. Some of the soil nutrients, there's macronutrients, nitrogen up, phosphorus down and potassium all around. And then on the right, there are some soil micronutrients. Nitrogen stimulates top growth. It's readily lost to the atmosphere, and it's most likely to burn plants and moves very easily through the soil. Phosphorus stimulates root growth, blooming, and fruiting, and 
critical to photosynthesis and evaporation. It's most unavailable to plants and it moves very little through the soil and because it clings to clay particles. Potassium promotes overall plant health, heat cold tolerance, disease and drought, and foot traffic. It is susceptible to leaching, however. How to read a fertilizer bag? Virginia passed a law that unless you need um, phosphorus for turf, you're not supposed to apply fertilizer with phosphorus to maintain turf. Really the only way to know if you need it is to have a soil test. The net weight of this bag is 42 pounds. So the 22, three and 14, that, that stands for nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. So 22% by weight is of the bag is uh, nitrogen. And you wanna be careful, the bag says feeds up to 15,000 square feet. Um, this can be misleading as it doesn't tell you the rate of application and the rate of application is based on the amount of nitrogen being put down. How much to fertilize? Cool season turf for sunny lawns, up to three applications of no more than 0.7 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per application per 30 days. Shady lawns, it's up to two application of no more than 0.7 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per application per 30 days. And there's a calculation for how much that is. So you take the area divided by the percentage of nitrogen as a decimal. So from the um, fertilizer bag in the previous slide, the decimal would be 0.22 times 0.7. Inorganic fertilizer or conventional fertilizer is ready to eat. However, it can damage microbial life in high enough doses. Organic fertilizer, microbes convert the organic fertilizer to inorganic. And with organic lawns and gardens, you feed the microbes, but not the plants. Free fertilizer options. Your grass clippings recycles a half a pound of nitrogen over the course of the year, less labor and cost. And clover, like we talked about earlier, a lawn that is 25% clover provides approximately one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. And clover also supports pollinator populations as well. Number 10 best management practice is repairing seeding. So seeder control weeds. A lot of weed control will interfere with seeding. So you have to decide, did you want to control the weeds or overseed? There's a windshield test. So if you drove by your lawn, does the lawn look good? Maybe you don't want to work on weed control and maybe you just want to overseed. It's really up to the homeowner and is subjective. So you can overseed at least every five to six years. You can do a partial renovation or full renovation. And if you really think about it, is turf really the best option for problem spots in your lawn? So if you have heavy shade, wet soil slopes, you might want to consider ground cover alternatives and or moss. So this is a picture at the teaching garden in Bristow, Virginia. So sh should I overseed or should I do a full renovation? Or the picture shows the teaching garden, but on the left side, it's not managed by us, but it's cut very short. And on the right, it is managed by us. So we're okay with having a few weeds, but overall, there's, we have a healthy, thick, dense grass, and we're okay with that. Don't obsess. Grass plants live three to five years, so overseeding can be beneficial every year, but isn't always necessary. You want to buy quality grass seed. If possible, buy the varieties listed in Virginia Turf Grass Variety Recommendations, which is published each year by the Virginia Cooperative Extension. How to read a seed tag. Virginia Tech recommends look at the seed freshness. Test date should be less than one year from plant date. Percentage of pure seed, the higher the better, circled in blue. And the red arrow, you want to make sure there's no noxious weed seed. How to read a seed tag. Virginia Tech recommendations percent germination in the purple arrow. The higher the percentage, the better the quality of germination. Circled in blue is other ingredients. So in most cases, the lower the better. And you wanna be aware of added nitrogen. So in this bag, which is seven pounds, there's 0.49 pounds of nitrogen. So this needs to be considered when planning your fertilizer for the season. How much seed? The recommended seed rate for tall fescue and tall fescue mixes. If you have an established lawn, 
or if you're establishing a lawn, it's six to eight pounds per thousand square feet. And then if you're just overseeding, it's less and it's three to four pounds per thousand square feet. Your lot size is not the amount of turf you have and over fertilization costs you money and harms the environment. So you wanna keep track of your lawn size as you add or reduce the amount of turf in your landscape. There are different ways to measure the lawn. You wanna to try to, <clears throat> excuse me, try to be as accurate as possible but when in doubt, underestimate the total surface area. So you, common measuring tools include tape, a wheel, and a hel handheld GPS unit. So you can break the lawn area into simple geometric shapes to calculate the total turf area. So rectangles, triangles, circles, you add all the turf area and then subtract the non-turf areas. So this photo, all the red dots are trees that would be subtracted from the total turf area. You want to calibrate your spreader before each use. Don't rely on the product label. And you want to calibrate before you apply lime, fertilizer, and pesticides. And there's more information on these links below about calibrating. You want to understand how your spreader applies product. So drop spreaders apply all the product between the yellow lines in the picture to the right below. There's a broadcast spreader which applies most of the product in a central swath and the remainder out to the side. So the picture on the bottom right, white line represents where most of the product lands, but the yellow line represents the maximum extent of application. Putting it all together, cool season grass fall workdays, there's three workdays. And the left side in the pink shows standard fertilization option. And on the right in the blue shows the organic fertilizer option. So you have fall workday one, then 30, at least 30 days later, you have fall work day two. And then at least 30 days later after fall work day two, you have uh, fall work day three. And the organic option assumes that grass clippings are being left on the lawn. And again, this PowerPoint will be on the YouTube page by the end of this week if you need to get a closer look at this warm season grass work days. So you have work day one, after the grass greens up, late May to early June. And on the left, there's a standard fertilizer option. And on the right in blue is the organic fertilizer option. Fall workday two will be at least 30 days after workday one. Again, the organic option assumes grass clippings are being left on the lawn. So you need to do these three things to have a better lawn. Number one is adjust the soil acidity pH so that it supports turf, turf grass and not weeds. You wanna regularly apply compost into your soil. And number three, fertilize at the correct time in the correct amount to promote healthy turf grass growth. Improved health of lawn will take care of many of your weed and pest problems. And if you have any questions about lawn care, soil testing, fertilizers, feel free to contact the Prince William Virginia Cooperative Extension Office at mastergardener at pwc.org. And if you enjoyed this program, let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes. More information on lawns and gardens, you can always contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Okay, we have some time for questions. If anyone has questions, please put them in the chat box. One question had to do with treating stilt grass. Uh, stilt grass can be treated a couple ways. Um, in terms of chemically, you can use a pre-emergent like what you would use on crabgrass. You would just apply it earlier in the season. Um, so here in Northern Virginia, that would be early March, weather per permitting. Um, the one thing that you do need to be aware of with using uh, pre-emergent as your sole method of controlling stilt grass, again, pre-emergent isn't 100% effective, so you're going to have some stuff coming up. But even if you get too much, uh, or even if you get all of the stilt grass, there's so much seed from previous seasons that it's gonna take some years to get, to have all those seeds start to come up and get killed by pre-emergent or hand pulling um, or post-emergent. There are some post-emergent products that are specifically targeted to warm season weed grasses and they can, uh, they can be used as post-emergent. The big thing is, you want to work with neighboring landowners because that seed came into your yard from someplace 
Um, and so you want to work as a team so you're all taking care of it because still grass seed can blow on the wind. It can move on the fur of animals. It can move on the feathers of birds and it can move with water. So you want to make it a team effort to make sure that you eradicate it. We have some questions about aerators. Uh, if you're looking to rent an aerator, there are some equipment rent, rental places. Uh, most landscaping places have uh, aerators to rent. The big box stores like Home Depot and Lowe's typically will have aerators to rent. Depending on what model they have to rent, they, they are heavy. Um, you probably need a small trailer or a pickup if you're gonna try and rent one and, and take it home. What is the harm in too much lime? When you start driving pH up, you run into the same problems with, with pH that's too low. The nutrients that the grass really needs aren't gonna be available. And so a lot of fertilizer that you apply is not actually gonna to get to the grass. The other issue is that you can get into some toxicity issues because some nutrients will be way too available. Some people are asking about um, calendars and charts. If you email the Master Gardener help desk line, we'll be happy to send those out for you. The video will be posted on our YouTube channel, which is VCE Prince William, and that should be done by Friday afternoon. Someone brought up a good point that the numbers on your lawn mower do not represent inches. Generally with our push mowers, we want to get as high of a mowing cut as possible. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately. Fortunately, because we have OSHA to regulate it, we will, you know, we can't have the mowers too high because otherwise you might slip a foot under there and that could be bad. But in terms of actually getting to the right cut size, unfortunately that's limited. And so typically with our, our push mowers, about the highest we can get is, and depends a little on the model, about three and a half to three quarters, or yeah, three and three quarters of an inch high. Um, so if you've got cool season grass, you wanna stay as, as high as you possibly can. And one other benefit aside from the deeper roots, every little bit of surface growth you have is going to provide shade and keep the crown of that grass plant cooler. And so in weather like we've had this, this summer, it does a whole lot to increase the survivability. What is next week? Next week we're going to be talking about cover crops for your garden um, as a way to increase the soil health and the fertility of your garden soil. Someone asks, what about a real mower, which is the manual spinning mower? Uh, real mowers need to be sharpened. Just like any other mower, it's a little bit hard to do that yourself, but real mowers are, are good tools. Um, if you have zoysia and you're cutting it, excuse me, if you have zoysia and you're cutting it low, a real mower is needed to get that low. But otherwise, it's a matter of how much lawn do you have? I mean, you know, you've got 100,000 square acres of, of turf, you probably don't want to use a real mower. But, um, you know, the real mowers are great for townhouses and small lawns. Those of you who registered, uh, we'll be sending out an evaluation to give us your feedback. Somebody's asking about native grasses for lawns. So there are two native grasses that we typically use, well, not typically, but that we can use for, for lawn substitutes. One is red fescue, which is one of the fine fescues. That's a native grass here to Virginia. The other is nimble will, which is a warm season grass. Nimble will has some good shade tolerance. It's a little slow growing, but uh, it is an option. It's a little hard to get seed for nimble will, but there are places you can get seed for nimble will. Red fescue is much more widely available um, and the fine fescues are great for shade. Uh, they will do really well in full sun. The thing with using any of the fine fescues in full sun is that they will go into summer dormancy really quick. And so the picture that Natalie showed you with the dormant uh, warm season grass in the winter time from Richmond, uh, that's what your grass will look like in the summer if you've got fine fescue that's gone into, that's gone into um, dormancy. 
if you, if somebody's asking, um, can we get a digital copy of slide, in, slide information? If you email us at mastergardener at pwcgov.org, pwc um, we can send you a PDF with the digital links. And that looks like, that looks like our last question. Thank you for, thank, uh, you. thank you for watching and we hope to see you next week. And again, if you have questions or comments or suggestions for other classes, please let us know and we'll see you next time.